Tonight, the five coolest guns from HK's legendary gray room. James eats some chicken, and he dooms one of us to a fiery afterlife. It's all happening now on the 1911 Syndicate. Welcome to Top 5 Guns, everyone. Here's how this typically works. We have a guest on the show, and from within their current collection, they show us the five guns that they would take. They could only have five guns that last for the rest of their life. Today, we, of course, have a little bit of a special edition. We're here with James Williamson, and we are in HK's Gray Room. Very special. This room. isn't his collection. This is not. Oh, you would love it. I'm confused. To be. Yeah. Sorry. And James will be selecting the five guns that he would take from the Gray Room, which pretty much means it's the coolest top five guns ever. And unobtainium to the extreme, right? Very much so. So James, maybe just begin with this. What is the Gray Room? Yeah, so the Gray Room is H&K USA's private um, collection or museum to um, showcase their entire firearms development from handguns, submachine guns, rifles, uh, sniper rifles, machine guns, even some uh, some other weapons that they didn't specifically make, but at some time was helping import. And what's really unique about here is you have some of the prototype weapons that led up to the development of something that went into production, and sometimes some prototypes that didn't go into production. So having a place that you can come in and actually not just see, but you know, reach up and pull down and and get your hands on these things and learn about the background of them. It's a really unique thing that, uh, unfortunately, a lot of firearms manufacturers just don't take the time and due diligence to, to bring all these things together. And the fact that H&K has continued to maintain this as they move from one location to, to the next is really cool. This one has been open just for a very short amount of time, and, and it is a a beautiful place to be. Well, and here's what's cool. If you guys stick around to the end of the video, we're going to give you a little bit of a insider's track on how you guys can actually come here. And I mean, dare I say, even get a deal on an HK in yeah. the process. It's a pretty interesting, I wouldn't even call it a loophole. It's just something that you guys don't really know about that we will talk to you guys about, but you got to stick around to the end of the video. Before we do that, um, James, you wear leather belts. Doesn't shock me. I mean, look yeah. at you. My Classy God. man. My God. Um, what my kind God. of belt do you wear, Jake? I wear nylon like oh. any other dude uh, in the tactical world. Less classy dude in the yes, tactical world. Absolutely. Um, but um, <clears throat> sponsor for the video, Sagar Gear. They've been with us for a long time now. We reviewed their stuff prior to them being a sponsor of the channel. We've got that linked below. They got EDC belts, battle wagons. Battle wagon is like, it's not a vehicle that you go to battle in. It's more of just a battle belt with a, with a, a spin, with a spin on kit. it. Um, there's code 1911 syndicate. You guys can plug that in, it saves you 10% off. Yeah. Now. That said, James, take us to gun number five. Gun number five. So for my picks, I actually broke them down into categories. And to start off, um, you guys know me pretty well at this point. I think the people who are watching this video know me. It is no surprise that for the pistol category, I'm going to pick a P7 series pistol. Mm. Um, it is uh, my favorite from the line. Um, it represents so many key factors, in my opinion, of what separates H&K from every other company out there from you know, their initial approach to um, the design, the, the features that they put on it. I mean, it's just completely out of the box thinking to solve a requirement and uh, continues to be the pistol that I choose as my concealed carry um, um, choice today. Um, as we talked about in the video we did before, you know, it's got several really unique features that if you're not familiar with the P7 might surprise you. Um, as you can tell, it's a very compact pistol, um, nine millimeter semi-automatic. <clears throat> it has a low bore access. Um, it has, you know, what would you call these up here on the top? Iron sights, it tritium. Look, it looks like sights, right? Yeah. yeah well, you say that because these three dot sights are the industry standard, right? Correct. Be hard pressed to go into a gun store today and find something on the counter that didn't have three dots. Well, the P7 series is the first production pistol to 
have those, and it's become standard since then. Uh, you have the ideal 110 degree grip angle, um, and you have a really unique delay system. If you're gonna use a nine millimeter, you're gonna have to come up with something. Most people have chosen the Browning tilting barrel design. H&K used a fixed barrel design, inherently more accurate, mm -hmm. and a gas retarded delay system, where in the eight step cycle of operation, the locking step happens after firing instead of before, and when that bullet goes down the barrel, some of that gas is directed down into, through the chamber into a gas cylinder, tries to move forward out the front, and a gas piston blocks its movement, locking the slide in position. So the bullet leaves the barrel before mm. the weapon goes into recoil. So again, <clears throat> the sights, the low bore access, the grip angle, the fixed barrel, the gas retarded delay system makes it a very soft shooting, very accurate gun. And then you combine it with the squeeze cocker mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, their attempts to minimize all the external levers and features you'd have to, to take care of, the, an external safety you'd have to defeat. Um, it's a striker fired system, whereas all the other weapons that were being designed for this specific contract were double action, single action. So you've got that heavy, um, long first trigger pull, then transition to a shorter one. And they found that was causing first shot accuracy issues. Now, you just have a grip safety in the front. I already have to grip the pistol to shoot it. When I squeeze that in, that draws the striker back to the rear, readies the weapon to fire, and now I have a short, light, consistent trigger pull for every yeah. single shot. Amazing trigger pull. And then it renders the weapon completely safe as soon as I let go of the, of the trigger. So, amazing pistol, but that's not my choice. If I had to pick a P7 series pistol, it would be the P7 M7. Mm -hmm. Designed with the intent to satisfy U.S. law enforcement and commercial requirements for a 45 ACP version of the huh. P7. Um, as you can see, if we look at them side by side, it's just a little bit larger mm -hmm. dimensionally from the side, or if we looked at it from the rear, you're going to see it's just a little bit bigger, as you might expect, for a 45 caliber uh, model, but all of the same kind of feature sets and they only made a handful of these in prototype development, and then it never went into full production. So to have serial number two here in the gray room <laughs> is a pretty special <laughs> thing. Yeah. Two, then, that, that's two, I missed hearing that, that's two, everyone. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. With this design, and as I've studied more and been able to focus more into the weapons, what I was able to deduce is that this is also a very unique one within the very limited production or prototype run. H and K was finding that the gas piston system was not sufficient with the additional pressures associated with 45. So they had to come up with a hydraulic recoil buffer system oh, geez. In, in those weapons instead of a gas uh, piston and cylinder. But this specific model was, as far as I can tell from the records and the documents and the things we've been able to find, is the only one that actually used the piston system. The other ones didn't. The other neat feature on this, and it's kind of an urban legend, um, but that has been passed down, is that this specific model, if you're a big fan of the 80s, like I am. Oh, you are. And, and you guys know I love some Magnum PI. The other big um, TV show that I was huge into in the 80s was Miami Vice. And the story is that this specific pistol was um, provided to the production company to be Don Johnson's character's pistol. And that's why it's got this nickel finish so it would stand mm. out more in the Hollywood look of that. Mm. Uh, no, no one really knows the story on why it was brought back, um, but he went on to instead carry the Bryn 10 also in a, in a stainless type finish. But this is one of, even though we're in the gray room, this is one of the few weapons I have not had the opportunity to fire just mm. because there's so so few, um, but is on my list because of that reason that I would love to be able to tick off that box of, of finding out yeah. what a 45 caliber version of a P7 really was, mm -hmm. was about. Very we'll cool. make some phone calls. Yeah, yeah I'll call a guy. I yep. know a couple of people. Um, okay, well maybe now we can just ask you a couple of questions. Sure. It's kind of how we do this show, sure. you know. We talk some guns, you know. and then we we, we, we sure. get to know you. You've been on the channel so much that I mean, we didn't answer all this on the eight eight hour car ride down here. No, no, no. no. You're gonna get Actually, some curveballs yeah. here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No. We so we start very simple. Also, which is, I don't like how you said eight hour in like a bad way. Yeah, yeah like it was miserable or something. Yeah. What it are you? Not. It, it was. It was wonderful okay. being that close to you. 
in a confined space, moving right. at a high rate of speed. Yeah. I yeah. thought the same. Yeah. Well, that's so. a nice, nice compliment. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, so how about that. this? How did you get into guns in the first place? Um, I, I'm sure this isn't very different than most other people, my father. So, um, you know, he introduced me to shooting. Um, you start out with the basics, but when it came to handguns, it was H&K firearms that, um, that I got into early. And that, that's kind of the funny story with my love affair with the P7 is that's really where I got introduced with this. You know, looking back, that, <clears throat> that kind of introduction, it's kind of like giving a 16 year old the keys to a Porsche. Mm. Like, you know, it's a great car, but if you don't have any experience with other lesser yeah. quality cars, Comparison. you don't know how good it is. Uh, so I didn't know how good it was until I got older and I got exposed to more and more firearms. And, uh, and I'm really glad I got started out with it. So P7. that was your first HK? Uh, the P7 was the first one that I learned to shoot on. Yeah, what was uh, the first my one you first bought? one that I was became my own was uh, right at the release of the USP series. Okay. I came home for, for uh, Christmas break from, uh, from the Citadel and I got a USP 40, um, brand new to the market. And then when I graduated, I went out and got my first P7. Very cool. <laughs> Very cool. All right, with that said, let's take you to gun number four. Gun number four, here we are. Yeah, again, like we talked with the P7, as you guys might expect, as people who know me might expect, if we're going to go into the submachine gun category, it's going to be the MP5 without question. It has to be. Um, and if you look at all the different models of MP5s that have been developed over the years, there is none better than the top millimeter, in my opinion. That's the 10 millimeter variant, the MP510. Mm. Mm. Um, I've only heard tales of the, uh, what would it be called? An MP5? P for, or still just an MP5, but it's MP5-10. Slash 10. Okay. okay. Slash, so this came out of a requirement from the FBI in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. As most of us know, watching the channel, the FBI had a, had a very high profile shooting at the end of the 80s that triggered them to decide to move away from 9mm as a cartridge and work with the development of the 10mm cartridge as the new hotness. Um, and they replaced their service caliber um, semi-auto handguns with those weapons. They already had MP5s and 9mm, were very happy with them, but then quickly realized from a logistical standpoint, having the same pistol caliber for both your submachine guns and your handguns would be a great thing, as well as um, limiting the chance that an agent's gonna put the wrong bullet in the wrong gun. Uh, they went back to H&K and said, hey, we love the MP5, can you build it in 10 millimeter? H&K responded, if you buy enough of them, we will. They certainly submitted that order and they were able to, uh, to create the MP510. Obviously, it looks like an MP5 9 millimeter because it is really the, the main differences are obviously the barrel um, for 10 millimeter, um, a slightly redesigned um, trigger um, housing with a little notch here for the bolt holder device, which we'll get to in a moment, and a completely redesigned bolt group. Um, so you have a new bolt, you've got a, a different extractor, uh, an extractor spring, uh, you've got a different set of rollers, you've got a different bolt carrier and a different recoil spring and a different locking piece, all to deal with the higher pressures associated with 10 millimeter. And then obviously you went with a straight magazine. We've got two examples here. This is an early polymer design, uh, clear design like they were doing with the G36. It's got um, the ability to, uh, to see through it. Uh, but when they went into full production, you have this kind of blue gray semi-translucent model. And you can see this one's got the dual mag clamp. But the main feature that, that, uh, that sticks out the most that makes it really different from a functional standpoint mm -hmm. is the incorporation of the, the uh, bolt hold open device. That was a requirement specifically from the FBI, mm -hmm. which obviously in combination with the magazine and specifically the follower of the magazine will lock the bolt back to the rear on the last round. And that really eliminates the main complaint that you have from people sure. who get introduced to an MP5 <laughs> today and they say, well, it's got this oddball manual of arms. It doesn't lock back the rear like an M16 or an AR15. Well, now you do. So you can still run it just like you do traditionally off the charging handle to do all your reloads and malfunction clearances, or you can run it like an AR15 where you have to charge it the first time, but every time the mag runs dry, you just reach up and, and tap that um, hmm. that release. That's it forward again. Hmm. Um, the main advantage of this though is in the caliber. Sure. And I think that's kind of lost on people today because 10 millimeters kind of fallen out of favor. 
And even if you went to the gun store today and you went to go buy 10 millimeter ammo, most likely, unless you're buying buffalo bore, you're getting a, a somewhat neutered 10 millimeter cartridge. It's not, it's not stacked to the pressures that it was when this thing first came out. But at that time, the muzzle velocity from 10 millimeter out of this gun versus nine millimeter was almost twice Holy the shit. number. Wow. Um, so it's still very controllable and roller delayed like you'd expect. There's a little bit more you know, push back into your shoulder, but yeah. where you really notice it is you've ever have the opportunity to do like a side-by-side -side comparison like I've been able to do in my MP5 courses sometime. If you're shooting steel with nine millimeter, you know, good ring makes you feel good, you're smiling, yeah. you shoot this and you can hear the effect and you're knocking that steel over. So from, you know, a close quarters battle type weapon, which is what this was designed for, mm -hmm. Uh, 10 millimeter is is devastating. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, hey, great backcountry around. I mean, a lot of people that live in the you know mountain climates like me, with bears and you know whatever other wild shits out there. 10 mil is great around. You know, yeah. you know, very cool. Okay, everyone, if you're looking for any ways to support the channel, um, real estate's the main way that you do that. That really helps keep the lights on. So if you're in the military, law enforcement, you like to shoot guns, you just like dudes. Um, Hanging out with dudes, or, or, looking at houses. Or if you dislike us, but you're like, well, I gotta hire someone. Um, we would like to do that anywhere in the US. Go to 1911syndicate.com, check that out. Um, I would also suggest around this time, we are working on a little bit of a kind of end of year product release, both on the apparel side with some hoodies and then something that should be uh, pretty neat. Probably best way to stay in touch with that is just sign up for the newsletter and we'll let you know when we have 12 of these particular little units available. Anyway, appreciate that. Back to the video. Even though I already know the answer to this, um, what is your CCW gun? <laughs> My CCW gun is the P7M8. There you go. Just featured, uh, you know, basically, hey, yeah. that, that's your carry gun. Yep. Yeah, which, I mean, you just can't find, you know. It's Again, like leather mad. belt. Yeah, yeah, it's like that, you know, mad classy. At you that, yep. that you're this guy. You're you got you got to get up to my level. That's 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 what it's we're, not achievable about. though. So that's why it's a little frustrating. Yeah. Well, so, speaking of which, um, so we've talked about it before, but you have the. What did I write down? I, I wrote it. I, I thought elo in an eloquent manner. You have the looks of a Hollywood star. And the voice of what most would describe as an angel. Yeah. Flattery okay. will get you everywhere, my friend. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, have you ever done any acting? I have not. In fact, this stuff with you is about the extreme level of it, and uh, it may shock you to know I don't feel comfortable doing this stuff. I don't, <laughs> I don't like to be the face in front of the camera, but I love talking about H&Ks hmm. and sharing the knowledge experience, so I'll keep coming back as long as you keep asking me to right. come back. Well, well you yeah. have a face four camera, no, so I do. be so in front of the camera more. So you're setting me up for something is what no, I'm No, not at all. No. This. Yeah. I, don't, you know, I don't know why this we is, call it a this setup. This is you. Uh, yeah, of course, ah. this is you shooting your, your beloved MP5, but you have glasses and it's a little tough to you know really make out the full, the full mug. So I guess where I'm really going with this is explain this. Yeah. I don't know that, I, you know, and that's been the result of some of the YouTube comment section for you guys. I've never seen the show that they referenced. It's Modern I, Family. You're I, on the show. I, I, I don't watch a lot of regular TV, so I've never seen the show, so people would reference it. I had to go look it up myself, but yeah. Do you think I'm stupid? I don't know. Don't insult I, me. I guess I shouldn't have shaved my beard. I should have left the mustache, and maybe that would have been a picture of, of Magnum P.I., and I would have been a lot happier than that. Look at the hair. But, you know, Dude, know. the hair, the level of gray, the face shape, the uh, eyes. I got, I got to go with it, I guess. We'll, we'll yeah. plant his face side by side on this. And you guys, both, look, and I'll have you know, when I went Vote to. Vote the comments. Yeah, yeah, right? you can co comment yeah. below on this. When I went to the um, home or the office depot to print this out, and the young girl, she's there, and she's helping me print this out. And she's, I see she's kind of looking like, I don't know exactly what I'm printing out here. And I was like, look, look, just tell me, do these two guys look alike? And she's like, God, it could, like, could be the same guy. And I'm just like, I, I understand. The rest my and I'm like, hey, and, and he's a friend of mine. The, yeah. the um, level of preparation for the setup is incredible. Yeah, no, it's not bad. It's not bad. Same man. It's the same guy. We have no photos of James yes. without the sunglasses. Mm -hmm. They look similar enough. Yeah, like, you could close. definitely. It's pretty close. Yeah. Well, like, I mean, I don't know if it'd be 100% without the sunglasses on, but like, if you saw them oh, from no. far away, you'd the be like. The sunglasses come off, and you're like, that's the guy. Okay. That's the guy. Yeah, I like it as autograph. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's definitely close enough to make you think about it. Yeah, exactly. But um, anyway, I guess with that said, we will take you to gun number three. Gun number trace. Yeah. Um, I think that the H&K fan base would probably uh, give me a lot of hate mail if I did a top five and I didn't talk about the the Kraut Space Magic weapon uh, that is the uh, G11. So uh, again, you talk about an example of what you would want to have. Uh, this is an iconic uh, H&K weapon. And for a lot of guys, it's their top bucket list weapon just mm. because there's been so much talk about it, a caseless ammunition type weapon. And because even if we imagine what this would be like to shoot, I guarantee none of us have any clue what that's really yeah, like. Yeah, I, I don't even understand the damn thing, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah. so most people, if they do know something about the G11, they think of it as an 80s development program, but in reality, it dates back- 60s. Yeah, late right. 60s. Yeah. Um, it wasn't soon after the German armed forces adopted the G11, I'm sorry, the- G3. The G3, that they realized that a 7.62 battle rifle was not effective in accuracy potential outside of really like a prone or a supported firing position. And once you put that into fully automatic and you tried to fire burst, you weren't having the effects that you desired to incapacitate those threats. And they did their own studies coming out of World War II and other thing, uh, engagements that found that the enemy was only going to be visible, even be able to be seen and have a limited window to be impacted upon for a short period of time. So what that meant was in that short window of opportunity, you needed to be able to deliver a maximum amount of accurate fire. So they realized that meant coming up with a cartridge that was still going to be accurate and lethal, but have less recoil. And they needed something that would be able to fire faster without the impact, impact uh, hitting the shooter. So they came up with um, a study for an advanced weapon and ammunition and centered around the concept of caseless ammunition. <laughs> um, it solves a couple of problems. One, weight. Um, if you ever pick up a box of ammo, it's really heavy, and, and the majority of the weight of that ammo is in the casing uh, for the individual cartridge. Yeah. If we eliminate the casing itself, being made out of brass or steel or, or whatever, we significantly reduce the weight. And by eliminating that and using caseless ammunition where the propellant actually holds all the pieces mm -hmm. of, of the important piece of the bullet. Now we've eliminated one of those steps, or actually two, extraction and ejection in the eight step cycle operation. So I eliminate two things, that's better. And through the use of hyperfire, which was another technique they did here, they were able to come up with a three round burst system where all three rounds could be fired before the recoil impulse wow. hit the shooter allowing it to stay on target longer. Yeah, that's fascinating. And that, hmm. obviously that program, the development, you had H&K who developed the weapon, uh, designed to develop the weapon. You had Dynamite Nobel who was developing and designing the, the caseless ammunition, which went through several iterations. And then you had Hinsolt and then later Swarovski who were developing the integrated optic for it. Um, went through the 1970s, lot of development um, within NATO countries and, and other things, changes in 5.56 ammunition. And at the beginning of the 1980s, it really got a push from the German Armed Forces and the U.S. Army through their ACR program or Advanced Combat Rifle Program. And that's where I think most people pick up on those models. Mm -hmm. um, they carried into these iterations. The one that we have here is the ACR uh, example. That was, uh, that was used through those tests that began um, really at the beginning of, uh, at the uh, end of it, 1989 and into 1990, and went against uh, three other competitors, one from Steyr, one from Colt, and one from another company that hasn't really gone anywhere since. Interestingly enough, all four weapons firing completely different types of ammunition, um, but the H&K uh, weapon performed um, admirably. They used 15 of those uh, weapons for uh, those tests with no major faults, breakages, or stoppages, um, hmm. performed really, really well, and was moving uh, forward for the U.S. Uh, Army. 
And then on the German side, um, they fielded first a set of test phase that went to the schoolhouses for their mountain warfare, airborne, and long-range reconnaissance. That took over about a year period. And then they had a formal program that was going to produce, starting in 19, late 1990, all the way through 2003, over half a million for the German armed forces. Um, so it was really gathering steam with all those places. But unfortunately, the fall of the, of the Berlin Wall changed all that. that. Um, mm. Germany as itself was much more focused on realigning both halves of their country. And without the great Soviet threat, um, you know, the ACR program hmm. um, lost its steam as well. And, uh, and we haven't seen this uh, G11 caseless ammunition program um, you know, got shelved and we haven't seen anybody really pick, on, uh, pick up on it since. Um, but for me, it's just another example of a company um, with complete out of the box thinking and where anybody else would have said, there's no way, this is too difficult a concept to do. The, the engineers at H&K uh, found a way uh, to make it happen. And it's a really unique system of operation, which we can kind of go through here as well. Sure, yeah, you know? help yeah. yourself. So um, first thing you'll notice is, you know, where is the magazine? Right. Um, on this model here for the ACR, you can see the top loaded magazine mm -hmm. where the ammunition is actually facing vertically down into the weapon. It's centered there. When they went to the German testing, one of the, uh, one of the feedback requirements was is because of the length of the magazines, which were either 45 or 50 rounds in capacity, meant that it, it's kind of hard to carry extra mags. You know, they hadn't really developed that thing. And they said, well, let's carry some more ammo. So they redesigned the handguard. And if you look here, you can see I've got one magazine actually loaded in the weapon and two more <laughs> mounted on either side of the weapon. Oh, get out of here. So that you can carry Whoa. three times the ammo capacity right on the gun. Holy cow. So like, what would the capacity be with that whole thing loaded up? So 150 rounds. 150 rounds on your gun. Actually, the, for this program, they'd reduce it down to 45 rounds, um, but that's quite a bit of, uh, of capacity. Wow. And they also did a weight difference um, study between the G3, they, they picked a certain weight capacity, and they said, okay, the G3 with this much ammo versus an M16 with this much ammo and a, uh, and a G11, and I, I'd have to check my notes to, to make sure I'm exactly right on it, but it, it was somewhere around you know, 100 rounds with the G3, 240 rounds with an M16A2, and over 500 rounds hmm. with hmm. this. So there's a major benefit from a weight saving sure. standpoint from having that capability. Yeah, man, that's crazy. The other unique feature, again, we talked about the ammunition feeding down, is it had a really, obviously, we'll insert some photos here of the actual barrel and bolt assembly, very complex system, but it had a drum, rotating drum bolt. Um, when you fired the weapon, the gas force that's being imparted back on that drum would rotate it so that it is now in perfect vertical alignment to feed the next um, caseless ammunition cartridge in, then it would rotate it back and allow it to fire. Hmm. That in combination <coughs> with a barrel, free-floating barrel and bolt system that moved to the rear together meant that you could fire three rounds as the bolt and barrel system were moving back to the rear before they went into full recoil mm -hmm. and then went back forward again, which was, even though you can see it's got safe semi, uh, three-round burst and then fully automatic settings, it was intended to be optimally fired in the three-round burst function. Man, what Super a cool. trippy, just, uh, you know, out of the box. Craziness. Craziness. All right, well, moving along. Um, huh. We asked people this to try to impart some actual uh, good things into the gun community. So we always like to ask everyone, how do we be stewards of the gun community and bring new people into it? Because I do believe as a community, that's something that must happen. I, I think that... A great example is what you guys already do through your channel. Mm -hmm. um, the videos you provide, the content that you cover, which covers a wide range. It's not just like me. All I want to talk about is H and Case. You guys are are wise enough to cover a, a wide variety of that and do it in a way um, that allows people to see you guys as approachable, 
as somebody that they can identify with. Well, and, one of us is well, approachable. Well, yeah. Well, you're you're, you're kind of a guy. You just like a, like a bear. I just want to give him a big hug. Yeah, I don't get that often. I don't. I don't get that. From oh, us. no one hugs me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not but, even his family. No. So. But but yeah, I, I see that, and I can relate to those guys and say, okay, well, these guys aren't scary. They're not. Um, they're not standoffish. They're not. Um, they're, they look like somebody I want to come hang out with, and uh, and I think that does a lot for moving uh, the topics and the things that you cover forward in a way that somebody else could say, okay, I want to I want to be like that too. Yeah, well, that turned into a shameless plug for us. That was very and, nice uh, of you. That's, that's thank very you. kind. Actually, every word was true. Yes, thank, thank you, you. Um, including your saying that no one has any desire to hug me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> A bit of a wild card. How much to run a Glock for the rest of your life? Couldn't pay me enough. One billion Stop dollars. Stop it. You won't. Ten billion. You won't even see a picture of me holding a Glock. I, I, I challenge you to use your best interweb skills out there and, and find something. I'm going to send you one. Just not going to happen. And you're going to open the box and you're going to throw up I, right then. I And my... My fans will like to do that because I provide the H&K armor services. On many occasions, they will send their H&K in a Glock box. Oh, <laughs> man, and that's on, And on many occasions, I will record a video of me taking it and throwing it right in the trash. <laughs> so. That's going to be a trend now that's after, so after you've, you've said this. Okay, all right, you're off the hook easy on that one. All right, moving on to gun number two. Okay, gun number two. You pick something lightweight, I see. Yeah, this is a big boy. Yeah. And it's another one of those ones where you, you may have played Call of Duty and you know, selected this, but until you actually pull it off the wall in the gray room, you have no idea the heft that's involved in this weapon, and it's for good reason. This is the PSG-1, a weapon that um, I don't think is gonna need much of an int introduction for uh, people. Uh, iconic sniper rifle. Um, coming up in the, the 80s as a kid, this was the one that you would see in the, in the books and magazines. Um, this was the one that, that every other real sniper rifle was, was measured against. Um, it comes out of a requirement from the uh, mid-1970s as a result of the uh, Munich Olympic massacre, mm -hmm. where uh, in the aftermath, they had found out they did lots of things wrong, um, but one of the things they found out was that their police forces were not armed with the, the best weapons in order to um, deal with that type of threat. They either had you know, G3 semi-automatic rifles with open sights, or they had more like deer hunting scoped rifles pressed into a sniper roll. Right. And when the engagement went down the, uh, in the low light conditions, um, those open sight G3s were not accurate enough, sure. and the bolt action scoped rifles were not fast enough to make uh, the necessary repeated shots or to yeah. transition from one target to the next. Um, so they went out to uh, some of the companies within Germany to look for a dedicated uh, precision semi-automatic sniper rifle, which at that time did not really exist. If you wanted accuracy potential out of a sniper rifle, it was bolt action. That was how you could get it. You just couldn't get the repeatability out of a semi-automatic gun. H&K's initial attempts um, from more of a budgetary standpoint were to make some mod modifications to their G3s, and they created some designated marksman variants out of that. But in 1981, they released the PSG-1 as a completely different weapon. And you might look at this and say, oh, it looks like a G3 because you see it shares the same magazine. It's got a similar receiver. But that's really where... Um, the similarities end here with this weapon. It is ground up, um, designed for a absolute uh, accuracy potential. You said the MOA was something crazy on these things. Half MOA from a semi-automatic gun God. and repeatable, which again, even to this day Unheard is incredible. Yeah. Um, this is one of the guns, as we look around this room, you can see some weapons that obviously are, are still ideal. You'd still love to have in your collection, mm -hmm. but if you were gonna choose something you know, you would say, well, there's probably a newer weapon out there. You know, the, the G3 is a great rifle, but the HK417 is a better version of a, sure. of a battle rifle. In this case, the PSG-1 could still stand shoulder to shoulder with 
um, a lot of the other designs that are out there for precision accuracy. There may be ones that are lighter and you know work well with a suppressor, but just straight up semi-automatic accuracy, it's uh, it's pretty incredible. Yeah. Um, starting in, starting from the receiver, and moving up, what you're going to notice is this large metal uh, reinforcement tab that's been added to it for strength and reliability. They did that off of their uh, HK21 machine gun program. You can see an elongated uh, handguard that actually has an intercept rail where you can um, attach a, uh, a bipod, like a Harris bipod. And they also had a very complex tripod design that I, I guarantee there was an entire design team that just created that alone. You can see a, a heavy, um, free-floating barrel that required a, uh, a more robust uh, trunnion uh, in there as well. And then moving back, you can see a different trigger group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Yeah. Semi-automatic only. At this time, this kind of walnut customized grip was really kind of an Olympic type yeah. rifle thing. Um, so they borrowed that as well, and it has an, an adjustable um, palm stop. So I can raise <coughs> or lower this to fit the size of my hand. And then you'll see this large, wide uh, trigger stop. It's a trigger shoe that gives you a wider, more tactile feel across the trigger itself. And then there's a stop there that prevents you from going any further back for over travel mm. than you need to to break the shot and cool. then reset for the next one. But internally is what is really important. Um, unlike the G3, which has a heavier trigger for military standards, as you might expect, in here they use a really unique counterweight system and a different spring setup that reduces the weight down to about five pounds. It's a very, very good trigger. Hmm. as you might expect for a weapon of this size. And then moving back to the rear, you have a redesigned stock and a redesigned recoil system to reduce the felt recoil to the shooter. And this is where we saw the first kind of a mass adjustability. Yeah, yeah, cheek riser and everything. You have an adjustable cheek riser and adjustable um, mm. stock for length of pull and rise. A lot of other weapons at this time would have adjustability, but it would be something you'd have to take back the armor, you take the stock apart, yeah. you put shims in, there's some trial and error, go back to the range, no, take this one out. All of this could be done with a little tool that would hold inside the stock and you could fit it exactly to yourself. And Very then cool. of course at the top, we see um, a, a fully integrated, like welded to the receiver uh, scope mount and a specific um, scope from Hensolt this is really the only thing that is holding this gun back from today's standard. Um, it's a great piece of glass, but it doesn't have all the functional features that we're, that we're familiar with now today. Uh, later into the 90s, H&K came out with the PSG-1A1 that updated that with the ability to mount other optics and uh, came with a Schmidt Bender optic, as you might expect that was better. And then internally to the weapon, they redesigned the bolt and bolt carrier. Um, I think you're going to see most noticeably on the side here what looks like a forward assist. Yeah, I was wondering what that was. <clears throat> and the notch is there visible through the ejection port and bolt carrier. This is actually a silent bolt closure device. And what this was meant to be, as we all know from our MP5 time, yeah. you charge this one up, you lock it back, and then you slap it down, you get that nice satisfying HK slap. Well, that's not something that you want to do if you're in, an, in a position and you're trying to be stealthy. So you could load that back if you kind of ease the charging handle forward instead of slapping in a roller delayed gun, you won't be able to put the weapon in battery. The rollers won't seat properly and then you go to fire, it's not gonna fire. No. In this case, you would do that and then you would tap this and it would push the rollers into position. Huh. The gun goes into battery. That's cool. The bolt was redesigned with a new extractor based off the HK21 and um, it also had a titanium coated locking piece and the rollers, instead of being completely circular, came with a half moon set. And the reason why that was is with a circular roller, every time the weapon goes in battery, the roller's in a different position, which means the bolt's in a different position. By doing a half moon setup where they're like cut off at the ends, that meant every time the weapon went in battery, it was in the same position each time, further enhancing the accuracy. So hmm. again, it's an incredible weapon. You can imagine with all the design and all the unique features on here, the price tag was high, and it was. I remember when these were out, it was like a $10,000 weapon, and, mm -hmm. uh, and that was a lot of the, the cover page stories and all the articles. Sure. Uh, today, because these aren't manufacturing more, they're collector's items, the prices have oh, gone up God uh, even, even more. Um, but I've also got, again, an urban legend about this one. I can't confirm if it's true about this one or not, but it's the story I've been told. Um, the first time some people may have seen this was in the movie uh, Lethal Weapon. 
in the scene where they go out to the desert and uh, and Riggs is is doing a, an overwatch position with a PSG-1 while Murtaugh goes in to get his daughter back. Um, the story that I've been told is that this is the weapon that H&K sent out <clears throat> for them to use for that. It's the weapon right. one, correct? correct? The original. Uh, that's got to make me go watch that now. Yep. 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 Now I'm going to go watch. We got a flight. Yep. We got a flight. Yep. And I got a phone. So Sounds like I know what I'm doing on, on the, the way flight. home. So that's the PSG-1, guys. Okay. How oh, cool. Very cool. <clears throat> Okay, so now we head into what I think is the easiest round. This is known as the lightning round. Usually there's like a little pressure. You know, like one of those. Totally not prepared. So, <clears throat> perhaps an easy thing for you to answer. What's your favorite fast food? Mm, that's very easy, and you guys already know the answer because I introduced it to you yesterday morning. I am a fiend for a good chicken biscuit, and Bojangles is my go-to, and the fact that they built one mm. literally at the exit of my neighborhood mm. is both wonderful and detrimental at yes. the same time. Very much, yeah. very much. Can you tell us your order real quick? I My go-to order is the Cajun chicken biscuit with mm. pimento cheese. And then she said, but we ain't got no more pimento cheese, baby. <laughs> no way. <laughs> pimento. Yeah. You got to have it. Let's that extra kick. And a Diet Pepsi because you're trying to watch your figure. It was, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Diet Mountain Dew. Yeah. Um, do you think you could identify a Cajun chicken biscuit? From taste alone. From taste alone. Of course. Yeah. Even if I had COVID and I lost my sense of taste. <laughs> yeah. oh. yeah. What? Huh. Oh, you happen to be in luck today, my friend. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. We might test this theory out, uh -oh. sir. Uh-oh. Again, totally unprepared for your level of preparation here. So you better step up. We're going to take a pause okay. and we will be back after this short break. Yep. See, I, I don't know why I walk into these things. Like, <laughs> I, I should have known at this point that they've, that they've, uh, I will be needing. Oh, no. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it, yeah. It, it literally looks like you're making me put a bra on my face. I don't care. Okay. <laughs> okay. Here it's not the care. first time you put a bra on your face. It won't be the last. Here we go. The okay. man is now blindfolded. <laughs> I could probably tell just by the bag and the wrapper you're handing me, so don't don't fool me now. Yeah, I'll cue you up with instructions. Well, if it's got pimento cheese on it, you know, I'll note that too. It does not. No. <clears throat> That'll be my out. I'll say, I'll say it didn't have pimento cheese. Now, what you're about to experience... The amount of trickery here. First things first. This was warm several hours ago. <laughs> <laughs> all, all things going in my favor if I if I lose this. Uh, I'm saying this test. that with all due respect, so that you know you're not about to bite into a warm chicken yeah. biscuit. And there's a hell of a amount of trust going on in this room. Well, I mean, I think I'm a pretty trustworthy guy, wouldn't you agree? You, you have to remember, I'm a marine, and we played lots of pranks on people through my career, and I, I feel myself balancing. <laughs> Continuously along that line. Now, if you lose this and do not guess correctly, you will guess. Cor Here's what you will do: you will guess which one of these is your what is it, what is it called? Filet chicken biscuit or something? Cajun some chicken chicken, chi chicken biscuit. biscuit. Um, and then you will also determine which one is best mm, okay. to figure out. Okay, is my beloved filet chi Cajun bullshit biscuit is that the best of the two biscuits here? Mm. Mm. Did this come from, from Utah? Is no. We don't have Bojangles out there. Is that the trick? You will now reach in front of you and index the biscuit. Yep, there's the biscuit. Okay. This is this taste one test one. Yeah. Yep. This one here? That's correct. Taste test one. Okay. Yep. Feeling for consistency. Fortunately, that one was not very consistent. Well, that's all biscuits, so I'm going to say no. On that, just on biscuit alone. You think it was too much biscuit? Too much biscuit. Too much biscuit. Okay. And the, and the yeah. paper doesn't feel right either. Oh, really? Yeah. Huh. I could be wrong, though. Well, that's fascinating. Okay. And then we moving another one in coming up. would be chicken biscuit number two. Oh, yeah. That's the texture. There was more of a crunch to that, I'm going to admit. Well, there's actually chicken in that bite. Yeah. So I'm going to go with that one. That that is the Bojangles. Good. You're saying this one is the Bojangles. That's what I'm saying. Maybe you fooled me on. Are it, you also saying you prefer this one? I I are I'm an equal opportunity chicken biscuit lover. So you have to Bojangles pick one. is you just have my to favorite. Pick one. 
Yeah, because the, the Jangles community yeah. is going to disown you. If I you... will I will pick this one, but I would have wanted it with pimento cheese. Okay. Yeah. Can I take off this bra on my face now? <laughs> yes, you may. Can? Okay. Which one did I pick? God dang it. No. <laughs> ah, I'm so let down. This, this is not, this is a Georgia biscuit, I gotta tell you. This is not, this is not a uh, North Carolina biscuit. I'm a little, I'm a little disappointed. But you know, I do love, I do love Chick-fil-A. We had Chick-fil-A today. Do you want to know Did you see the, me have a problem with eating Chick-fil-A? Do you want to know the real cliffhanger what here? What is the cliffhanger? I switched those biscuits. You did. That's you did. the jangles. This is the jangles. That's the jangles well, right see? there. Well, then I don't I feel bad I put it on the Chick-fil-A wrapper because I thought it. you would spot the, the, well, the then, jangles wrapper. Well, then I was right after all. You actually this, got it correct. Because that was too thick. Okay, Chick-fil-A, Chick-fil-A. I love you guys. This? What is this? This is unacceptable. Yeah. This is just this bare portion of the back of it. I, I, if I'm being perfectly honest with you, that does look more appetizing. In this moment, if I was picking one, I would pick that one. I'm so happy. Based on what's alone. Right. So you won't be exiled. Okay. We were just holding our breath because you touched the wrapper. You're like, that's not the right wrapper. And I we're did. like, oh, it's the right I wrapper. Did, but I also, so confident. I, you know, it's one of those things where I, I knew you were devious enough to pull something yeah. like that. Yeah, I'm dirty. Yeah. Okay. We're going to have to take a break so we can finish my biscuit. Yeah. 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 We'll, we'll just keep we'll, going. We'll just leave that one in front of you. <laughs> Because really, there's only one more question left. Yep. Um, it is something that we... Can like you that. not take a bite of that if it's in front of you? Like, you physically can't if not If I don't do eat it, it, you will. No, no, I'm, I'm stuffed, trust me. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the dig on that one. Okay, so we ask all of our guests this. It's kind of the, the finale. Um, so... Who's more likely to go to hell, me or Chris? Oh, wow. That's a tough one. Um, definitely you. Yeah. So far. <laughs> We're like five for five. <laughs> I'm five for five right now. Uh, okay. I'm well, undefeated. Thanks. Another way to look at that is it. undefeated. Un oh, well. Okay. You can, you can, you yeah, Satan can shape live it that. however you Why? want to. Why? You know, what do I, I do? I, yeah, sometimes things are just gut reactions, and you don't even have time to like put conscious thought to them. And what well, he just said is he has a visceral reaction it, when it you just, ask that question. A visceral of reaction. damning you to hell. It just felt right. It felt right, and, and probably because you made me do this this test. This like, didn't help me, did it? No, it didn't. It didn't. Didn't you know ingratiate you into my favor? Damn it. Okay, with that said, we're taking your gun number one. Okay. And we have to go over here. Yeah, you can take your basket with you. That was awesome. <laughs> I guess gun number one? Yeah. Definitely, by far. And this may be kind of weird for people because they're going to think something more traditional. In fact, there's a lot of people, even H&K fans, who probably do not know what this is. I didn't when you mentioned it last yeah. time. I was like, wait, 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 what? Yeah, this is the GMG, or grenade machine gun. Yeah. And Just, yeah. yeah. You know what I'm it, saying? It sounds good it's to say. It's guttural, like, yes. And then you look at it and you go, okay, I want to know more. Um, even though most people don't know about it, if you really talk to the people who know H&K firearms and yeah. know how they're designed, I would say this is arguably the best <clears throat> weapon they've ever made mm -hmm. from all the really? function and, and its capabilities and the safety features, especially when you compare it against the other types of these that are out there. Like a Mark 19? Or? Exactly. Okay. So if you're a Marine like me, um, you're familiar with the Mark 19, capable weapon, but there are definitely some shortcomings. And I had experience at the schoolhouse where we were in charge of the program instruction that taught that to the Marine Corps. <coughs> um, it has some really unique manual of arms things. It's got some safety related concerns. I mean, you've, you've got to actually take a, a punch and like shove it inside the thing to unload the weapon properly. Um, it's heavy. Um, it's just not an ideal system. And once again, you see H&K take a requirement and just over engineer and, uh, and make it very modular and better than anything else is out there. So. Grenade machine gun. What does it give you the capability to do? Well, Full auto machine gun grenades? Exactly. Huh? And today we got the opportunity <laughs> to go to the range and shoot the uh, XM320, yeah. the 40 millimeter um, grenade launcher that's in service with the US military. 
that shoots a 40 millimeter low velocity grenade, single okay. shot. Okay. So, you know, talking out to about 350 meters. This shoots a 40 millimeter high velocity. Oh God. Out past 2000 meters. Oh yes. And <laughs> yes. Obviously reach out and touch somebody That's with over some- over a mile. With some, uh, with some high explosive uh, nature. <laughs> So uh, that in itself is pretty cool. Um, but how they do it um, is what is really interesting for me. So you can look at some of the features on here. You have you know, your kind of butterfly spade grip um, that you have. They also have the ability to remove this and hook up a remote control solenoid. So if you had it inside a vehicle, you could fire from a weapon uh, mounted um, remote position. You can mount this in a, uh, in a tripod system. You can see this kind of a medium mount for an MG5. Mm -hmm. They have a specific tripod for the GMG that allows it to fire up high yes. or down in a seated position. Um, so if you were out there in some kind of defensive position, you can do that. You've got vehicle mounts as well. The German military has been using it for years and you'll see it a lot, a lot of their armored vehicles. Um, <clears throat> you have a shoulder support um, that allows you to push with your shoulder as you turn it and rotate the weapon as well. You can also see, I'm not a motorcycle guy, but if I was, I would definitely find this part number and order this H and K um, you know, handguard on there. But one of the unique features on the fire control is unlike some of the other grenade machine guns that are just full auto. So if you fire as you're trying to get yourself zeroed in, you're shooting more rounds than you probably would want to otherwise. And there's not a whole lot of rounds in an ammo can anyway. Um, on the H&K design, they actually have a semi-automatic and a fully automatic setting. So I can zero myself yes. down. Then once I get on target, rotate. A really safe design <clears throat> where when you're on safe, it actually rotates a lock that holds the bolt so it cannot go forward. Unlike the Mark 19 where you gotta pull both charging handles back and then shove another one forward, there's just one bottom mounted charging handle. Yeah that sends the bolt back to the rear, and mm -hmm. now it's locked in position. And then I can rotate and select it forward. An additional safety feature, on the bottom of the bolt, there's additional ratcheting positions. So if I was pulling this back and I didn't have it on safe, and I let it slip because my hands were wet, and it, it starts to move forward, it's not gonna go forward and, and have a slam fire, a negligent discharge is actually gonna catch the bolt along the way, which is neat. It's got a firing pin safety that prevents the weapon from firing. If it's not in battery, it's got a uh, re removable barrel. And if the barrel isn't in place uh, correctly, you can't open the feed tray cover to okay. even load ammo. Another safety feature. Another safety feature. When There's you, a capacity <clears throat> on this bad boy. Yep. When you open the feed tray, you have the ability to load the ammo from the left. Or if I make a slight configuration that I can do at the user level, I can configure it to, to feed uh, from the right. You've got fixed iron sights that take you out to 600 yards, or I'm, this one uh, elevated one out to 15, or you can mount any number of, the, we got a reflex sight on here, you can do night vision optics mm. on there as well. Mm. It is an incredibly capable system Yeah. that again is in service with the German armed forces and with, um, with a lot of other European countries and some unique places here in the US that we won't discuss that you, but that you would be very surprised I think to see, but then if you did say, oh, that makes sense as well. Makes uh, sense. But Pick rails so you can attach like a string. So this is what we're taking out line. next, right? Yes, I, I, I highly recommend you get the opportunity. I've gotten to shoot uh, this, and it's another one of those bucket list items that if, awesome. you, if you haven't had the opportunity to squeeze off a six to eight round burst what's with this, the, you uh, need to. What's going on here? Yep, you like that? Is that where you fire? Yep, so you can fire it from here as well. You can see when I put it in the semi, it's gonna fire forward. That's your bolt going forward it's and releasing. Did you get a little scared there? Oh, we're all dead. Or you can fire from the butterfly. butterfly. Right. Wow. But yeah, pretty uh, pretty cool system. Um, yeah, I need, like I said, I need. I, I need. need to you, get you, my hands you start on thinking it. about your tundra and some modifications mm -hmm. you guys could do. Right. To, I'm trying to think how someone could you know offhand shoot that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Or yeah. like if you're flying, like what does TSA say if you try to check that? Well, we as could, long as uh, you we might have find to out today. Delta. I don't know. Well, that's one thing. I was going to check that. I was gonna make a joke, you'd have to pay like an overweight baggage fee and that's it. But they shaved 14 pounds off yep. of like what a Mark 19 weighs compared to this. It's lighter, it's safer, it's more reliable. It, it's just <clears throat> an overall um, better system. Yep. Look, I'm into it and whoever at HK, we have to do whatever we need to do to, for them to say yes to let us do a video on that. That's that's what needs to happen. That's probably the best number one we've had thus far. I, I mean, to beat, beat this, you're looking at, you know, 
like some fixed wing stuff. A battleship. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, a battleship. I was going to say an F-16. Yeah, so. no, I mean, I mean this like, is awesome. come on, son. It's pretty cool. Come on, son. Well, that is number one. And with that said, we will take you to, as promised, as we stand here in the gray room, a little sort of tidbit on how you guys can come check this thing out. Okay, everyone, as promised, we told you we would show you a little bit of a hack in terms of how you can actually come see the gray room. Because, of course, you can't just come knock on the HK door and say, I'd like to visit the gray room today. So we're here with Bob Schultz. Bob runs the armorers classes here at the uh, HQ facility here in Columbus. So maybe give us like a snapshot of what we do in armorers classes. Certainly. Uh, we provide factory level armorers training for over about 15 different models of firearms, all HKs. Uh, with that comes uh, classroom instruction, either here or on the road. Uh, this incorporates inspection procedures, troubleshooting, spare parts, gauging, and with most of the armors classes, the majority of the time is spent on assembly and disassembly. Cool. Awesome. That's the most truncated, well-packaged thing I've ever heard in my entire life. That's, yeah. that's, that's incredible. So what are some of the models that, that you do? Well, we offer both civilian classes as well as military. Mm -hmm. So in the military classes, our popular ones are the HK416 mm -hmm. and now the M110A1, the um, SDMR rifle. Yeah. yeah. For the civilian courses, our three primary ones are the MR556 and 762 rifles, mm -hmm. the SP5 pistol, and the VP series of handguns. Okay. Hell yeah. And then, um, James, tell the... I can't almost even believe that we're telling you this, but the little like benefit that you get from coming to the armors classes. Sure, there's actually multiple benefits. Um, you know, first of all, you get to to be here under the tutelage of Bob Schultz, or as I was uh, just informed, we've got a new term for this: the BSC, the Bob Schultz Experience. Experience. And for those of you who have worked with Bob before, you know exactly what I'm talking about. He's a wealth of knowledge, and uh, and it's just a joy to work with him and to learn. Uh, from his vast knowledge and experience. But at the end, not only do you get your graduation certificate, you get to take your armorer's manual back home, but you get access to the gray room. And Bob gets to take you through there, answer your questions, let you pull the weapons off the wall, have a little bit of selfie time uh, with H&K, and you get a discounted coupon towards the purchase of any of the commercial products from H&K, which um, is really can cover the cost of the entire trip, uh, depending on which weapon you want. It's a 40% discount, and that's uh, pretty incredible. I know you guys like math. I that's do. a big Not number. Not in public. Oh. Yeah, I just know it's a big number. <laughs> hey, look, man, you go MR556. I mean, you're talking, that's roughly 1,500 bucks, give or take a little bit. You go, okay, look, man, that's, that's good, good. So anyway, come out to the armor's classes. They're very, very cool, and we'll see you guys. All right, Jake. So if you're ever in a legally justified self-defense scenario, I say with- grenade machine gun counts. Well, if it's legally justified, it would. Yeah. Or say like you have maybe a full auto MP5 in like a suitcase and you had to use that. Yeah. You would want what? FLP, fire alarms, firearms legal protection. This would be the answer to that. Because what they do is they cover you if you're in a legally justified self-defense scenario. And also when you call after said scenario, you don't talk to a customer service rep, Jake. You talk to an attorney. Which is what I need. Yep. Especially, Another thing yeah. that I want to inform you on, they have several different plans. They have a single lonely guy plan. Mm -hmm. They have a married guy plan that travels around the country doing the dang thing. And uh, our code, 1911, will save you about a third off each one of those packages. So if you're an adult, you carry a firearm to protect you and your family, you should have insurance as well.